Oh, welcome everyone. I had a little trouble with my mute button there, uh, but welcome everyone. My name is Missouri Colley and I am the Development and Database Manager with Women's Foundation California. And I'm very happy to welcome you to our session today, which is Investing Fundamentals Part Two. This is a um, the second session in a two-part series uh, that we have pulled together through our California Women Rising program of the Women's Foundation of California. Um, in this session, we're going to talk or learn, actually, I'm not going to talk about these things. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to learn about managing risk, investment trends, investment professionals, red flags, and fraud. This session is going to be led by Leah Davis, um, who is very accomplished and very, very um, um, just I learned so much from you actually, Leah, the last session. So I'm very excited to hear and learn from you again. Um, and I don't want to uh, talk too much because I wanna make sure that we have enough time to hear all the information that you're gonna share. Um, so with that being said, please make sure to um, introduce yourself in the chat with your name, your preferred pronouns, um, as well as the native land that you are currently joining us from. We'd love to know that as well. So again, welcome. I'm very happy to be in community with you today and I will turn it over to Leah. Thank you so much. Hey, so good to be here, beautiful ones. It is International or National Women's Day. I think it should be every day we have this kind of a celebration. Um, I was thinking about it like I haven't done much today. I've been working, but I was I took my son prior to this to practice side note here. And I was thinking about this, going, man, I haven't really done much. But you know what? I decided after this session, I'm probably going to sit on my couch and binge watch Love is Blind because that's what I do. I'm a woman. I've gotten sucked into that show. Welcome everybody. I am here. Oh, it is international Wednesday. I don't have a national international. All right. So we've got as Ali. Uh, welcome. And coming from the Muakama Ohlone land in Oakland. Wonderful. So yes, we're going to start today. I would love to, for those of you who are here, feel free to unmute or put in chat. Just give me one word on kind of how you're feeling arriving here today. I'm feeling, and I'll start with myself. I'm just going to use one word. I'm just feeling um, calm. You know, I'm just feeling calm. And that is wonderful. So if you want to put in the chat how you're arriving, doesn't matter, share what you're feeling, sensing. It's been a long day today. Um, she's feeling, hi, Jasmine. Your internet's unstable. Sorry to hear that, but it happens. And you're feeling eager. Ooh, I love that one. Anybody else got anything? Share with me and how you're arriving to our session today. Please do share. Again, feel free to unmute, put in the chat. And if not, that's all right, too. We've got, um, all right, some familiar names, I think, from the last time when I was here. Um, all right, so I think it would be really good. Okay, Ali's saying I'm feeling unseasonably warm. Unseason, it is warm, I know. I'm, I'm enjoying it at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh man, I, I, we gotta get some rain. Uh, it usually rains on my kid's birthday on March 3rd every year, and it didn't really rain this year, which is interesting. All right, so, why don't we just do a little bit of a grounding exercise? Just gonna be pretty simple. Not a lot of breathing. It's just a technique that I've used over time when I'm feeling like just kind of scattered or like I'm not able to focus. Not that this is gonna be a heavy topic. It's really not. I like to keep things light and fun. If you were here last time, you got a taste of me then. Um, so if you like, you can Close your eyes or just lower your gaze, look off to the side, look at me. I don't mind whatever you feel in the moment. I'm going to close my eyes because I'll, I'll get lost in talking and this will help bring the center of me. So if you just maybe put your feet or wherever you're seated, seated, if you're on your bed or a sofa on the floor, just wherever you are, if you have the ability to put your feet and plant them on the ground, you can even be standing um, and just kind of slow down for a minute. And take a breath in just at your own pace. No deep breath if you don't want to, or a deep one. You can breathe into the count of two and breathe out to the count of three. But what I'd like for you to do is just think of one word. And for me, that word is trust. It shows up often in my life, the word trust for me. But think of a word 
and kind of slow down and focus on that word. And then if you can be still with that, see that word kind of flash across the screen of your mind or just maybe think about the word, spell it out. And just kind of focus on that, whatever that word is. It may be an invigorating word. It may be a calming word. It may be something that relaxes you or brings you some joy. It could be the name of somebody. And just kind of hone into that. And then feel some sense of gratitude or appreciation for that word, however it's arriving and showing up for you. Just sit with it for a moment. And we can be intentional with that word. If it's love, if it's appreciation or something to do with health or wellness, abundance, just gratitude, just feel that sense of gratitude and appreciation for where you are in this moment right now and that you're taking the time for yourself on this wonderful, beautiful, unseasonably warm day, wherever you are. And just take a breath or two. Maybe feel the seat underneath you, some air on your skin. Any hear any sounds or no sounds? And just kind of be present. Just relax and do it. So I'm gonna to count to three. And then when I count to three, we'll get going here. So one, two, and three. Okay. That word is trust for me because, um, you know, that's been a word that has shown up in my life quite often. Uh, and I didn't know that I had issues with trust, trusting my own decisions, trusting in others, trusting things that are happening. And over time, I've learned that that's pretty common for us uh, women, especially us who come from diverse backgrounds in this world and having to navigate so many com complex things. And here we are today talking about investing today. We're gonna talk about this involves money. This involves trusting the choices and decisions that you make. Right. And if you're anyone, I would love to, if you could maybe put thumbs up or put it in the chat. Are you somebody that experiences second guessing the decisions you make or the choices you make? Or do you sense that you might, I see a thumb up there. Thank you, Ali. Tanya, got it. Missouri, got it. Nina, yeah. That second guessing, am I doing the right thing? Uh, Alicia, thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, Jasmine, got it. Okay. So we got something in common there, right? And I will say over for myself, I constantly second guess the decisions I made. And over time that has gotten smaller. And so that for me is just trusting the process. And that's why I use the word trust because we do have a natural intuition instinct. And this will go into our conversation today too when I get especially to the red flags and fraud and paying attention to our natural intuition and instinct of when things show up for us. So I wanna go ahead and get the screen ready here so I can get things going for us to start on our conversation today. All right, how does that look? Everybody got that? You good? Okay, so session number two, investment fundamentals. For those of you, if you were not here last week or last month, <laughs> that's gone by so fast. A little bit about me. So I am a mother of two. I have a 24-year-old son and I have a 12-year-old gender expansive child who I love and adore. And I am, have a 12-year age difference between the two. My youngest just turned 12 and I can't believe my youngest is 12 and my oldest was 12 when I got pregnant with my youngest. Time flies so fast. I'm a CrossFit athlete. I've been CrossFit for eight years. It has been something that has been a vital part of my healing journey uh, as a survivor, adult survivor, child of domestic violence, and also experience it later on in life, intimate partner violence. Something about being able to pick up a really heavy weight and tossing it on the ground. Let me tell you, it feels really empowering to do that. And um, I enjoy running. I don't have it on there, but I also enjoy running. And uh, I'm an entrepreneur. 
I'm the founder of Leah Davis Coaching, where I provide wealth and wellness coaching for diverse women all over the world. And I was a financial advisor for about five years. A little note on that. I started in on that journey because I wanted to learn about money. So I was like, what do I got to do to learn about money? No one taught me. No one. I mean, young single mom at 18, I was just floundering, trying to figure things out. And then later on in life, I realized, you know, I can make a career out of this. And when I went into the industry, I was thinking I was going to learn all about the stuff that I know now as a coach, which is about financial empowerment with my own finances and how to have that financial stability, which is so important for us as we're building our, um, some people call it wealth, some people call it just our, our um, financial life and our desired outcomes, whatever it may be for you, right? So for me, I want to be, I, I have this, and curious too, put in the chat or thumbs up again. I don't can't see all of you. I wish I could see all of you, but I would love to know how many of you are here because it is your mission to change the trajectory of your family's um, financial situation. For me, that's me. I am that woman in my family. And it can also feel kind of lonely sometimes because I speak a certain way. I, you know, I talk a certain way and not everyone in my family understands <laughs> or gets it or is on the same page. All right, I see some thumbs up there. Thank you over there. Okay, uh, so I'm a financial coach. I've been coaching now for three years. I love it. It is my calling. Um, and I also mentioned I'm a domestic violence advocate. Okay, so onward forward. This is what we're going to talk about today. Okay, we are going to, and I'm going to help you discover options for portfolio management and common risks that are associated with investing. There, when we invest, there's going to be risks, right? I mean, and when we invest our time into something, when we invest in a relationship, there's a risk. There could be a risk, right? So same thing with investing our money. There's some common risks associated with investing. So I wanna cover that with you today. We're gonna to talk about asset allocation and the purpose of rebalancing portfolios. If this sounds like foreign language to you, don't worry, you'll have it down by the time we're done today. And I'm gonna chat with you and we're gonna go over some investment scenarios and life cycles. I'll explain more of what that is as we go along. And then I wanna you know, raise awareness for you on how to protect yourself from fraud. There's a lot out there. You know, um, and it's it's kind of scary, but at the same time, it's a matter of having this awareness and knowledge and then just making choices, right? And not doing things like super impulsively. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, any questions so far, comments on what we've got going on here today? Anybody put in chats? And by the way, feel free to unmute yourself as I'm going along. I'm totally fine with it. If you're like, hey, Leah, I have a question. Hey, Leah, I have a thought. Totally cool with it. Okay. Yes, Elsie, you will receive the PowerPoint afterward. It will be sent to you. Uh, all right. So risks. Ugh, that word. There's no way out of it. When we're, when we're going to go into investing, there's going to be some risk involved. So these are some of the risks. So I'm going to go through them for you so you can get an idea of what it is. So just overall, in general, when it comes to investing, the, the risk could be that the person who's investing your money might get disappointed that they're not going to get the returns that they thought, right? I mean, that's just it. We're putting the money in and we're on course and it could happen, right? Oh, thank you, Elsie. You're awesome too. Uh, so first type of risk is business risk. Business risk, it's uh, the company that you're invested in might go bankrupt or it could do really well, but there's risk associated with it. We can't control that. We cannot control what happens to the success of a you know, company that we, the type of stock that we purchase and what happens to that company, right? I mean, they, if it's been a company that's been around for many years, it could still go down. I mean, we saw this with the pandemic. What store was it? Oh, there was some, we loved going shopping at this store and it disappeared during the pandemic. I was so hurt. But anyway, it was my go-to when I wanted a little escape from home to go browse. And it wasn't home goods. If home goods is taken away, I'm going to be hurt. Anybody else feel that? I will, I will be so hurt. It can't happen. Home goods is here to stay. Okay. Then there's going to be volatility risk. 
So volatility, just think of fluctuations, big ups and downs in the market, how vol is volatile, right? So there's volatility risk associated with investing because, I mean, honestly, if we were at that age of retiring and the market is going through huge ups and downs and so volatile, that's where a lot of people who are at retirement age are like, oh my gosh, give me off. Or not even that. Some people don't want to have deal with a volatile market. Anybody have any concerns over that? Just like, oh my goodness, I don't want to see my account. Ah, I see Allie's hand go up. You want to share with me a little bit, Allie? What, what well, part of it? Yeah, it just feels like gambling. And that doesn't feel like saving and investing and uh, building wealth when you're gambling. Oh, interesting. So it feels like gambling to you. Okay, so when it goes up and down, you're talking about like, can you elaborate a little bit more on it feels like gambling? Specifically the stock market. Okay. So taking a big chance there. Yeah. All right. Trying to buy something low and get a bunch of money out of it. Got it. Okay. No, I hear you, right? There is that volatility and that comes with investing. You know, that's part of being an investor. You know, um, there's not much we can do about it. Like right now, I mean, this is the market. We got your gas prices that have gone sky high, right? So we have less money. So there's, <laughs> we got Missouri six like shaking her head. I know. I, my, I'm here. I'm in San Ramon and my mom lives in San Jose. So I took a trip down to San Jose this past weekend. I'm thinking I'm not going next weekend because I just want to drive. <laughs> I'm going to spend so much on gas. Well, what do I got to do to walk to the store and get some groceries? Time to buy electric. I know, man, I do need to get a new car. It's on my list, but I'm not buying a car now because of the cost of things. I'm waiting for the price to go down because what goes up has got to go down. Okay. And it goes up, it's got to go down. So just like with the market, if it goes up, it's still got to go down. So back to my car situation, my 12 year old is just like, mom, you have to get a hybrid or you have to get an electric vehicle because it's good for the environment. I hear it every day, even on the back of my beat up old Jeep, she cut out the little stickers and pasted on, stuck them on there about having an electric vehicle. I don't know. My kid's really drilling it in me. So I'll be that parent. I'll have an electric vehicle. Okay. Then there's going to be inflation risk. That is basically, you know, when you're investing, the, the plan is, is we got to keep pace with or beat that inflation because we you know if the inflation is high, like we're experiencing now, we're just going to have less dollars to buy, right? So if inflation is high at the time of retirement, it's like, oh man, right? So having a plan and being able to mitigate that as much as possible is, is ideal. Then there's liquidity risk. Liquidity risk, I want you to think about this. So, um, yeah, last time we were together, I talked about um, having cash and a bank account, right? And so being able to have uh, access to that, it's liquid. Well, maybe it wasn't here, I'm sorry. But either way, when you have cash in a bank account, it's liquid because that means you can go to a bank and pull your money out. Well, when it comes to investing in stocks and having your money in brokerage accounts or retirement accounts, you can't just get on the computer and have it transferred to your account. It's not that liquid. So you need to give, it's called T plus two in the financial world. So, you know, if you, let's say, let's say, for example, today it's 519, you know, PM right now, stock market is where, where is it at? Is it on the West coast or the East coast? Where are we at? East coast. East coast. Right. So here we are in California. So if somebody's like, man, I want to like, sell some of my stock because I'm going to get this cash because there's opportunity right here. And they call their brokerage or they put in the order to sell some stocks and get their cash, but they do it at two o'clock PM Pacific, missing the boat because the stock market, ding, 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 four o'clock Eastern time, done, right? So you want to, that's, you know, so the, and so then there'll be a delay. So if you miss that for that day, being able to do this, the trade that day, they'll do it the next day. And there's always two more days on top of that before you actually get the proceeds, right? But if you met it, if you sold that stock and did that transaction at 12.55 p.m., <laughs> it hits it for that day and it'll be two days after that. You don't have to wait for the next day. Any questions that I confuse you with that? But that's, you know, I just want to make it clear that, you know, there's that liquidity risk that when you need the cash right away, you may not get it right away um, for your um, stocks and for your accounts, investment accounts. Okay. Then there's time horizon risk, also known as life cycle. I'm going to get into that in a second. When you see the word time horizon, think life cycle. So there's risk associated with the shorter time that you have in something invested in, the less risk 
there is because there's a shorter amount of time for things to happen, right? Now, when there's a longer time horizon or a longer life cycle over years, there's a higher risk with that, that time horizon risk because it's invested in the stock market longer. So more things can happen during that time period. So less risk, the shorter amount of time for your money, money to return to you. Does that make sense there? Questions? Does it, comment? Does it balance out with the fact that, um, I guess, like the longer time you have, the more time you have, I guess, to like ride out any like volatility or like big, up, big ups and downs as well? That's, that, that is there, correct, right? So there's that, that's proven, right? The longer time you have, history shows over time, that eventually just could pretty much going to be okay. However, even when you do have something invested a longer time period, there is more risk than if you had it for a shorter time period. So I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, let's go on to the next one. Um, I'll get to that one. So I'll show you. So another way to hedge some risk is to understand that there is the Securities Investors Protection Corporation. So CIPIC, that's what they say in the financial world. CIPIC, if you ever hear CIPIC, been protecting investors since 1970. So what CIPIC does is protects the securities and cash in your brokerage accounts for up to 500,000. And that also includes 250,000 of cash in your account so that you can buy more securities. So this is here. So why this is important is because when you have a stock, right? Well, that is registered with the SEC and that's called a security. Stock is a security and CIPIC will protect that. So for example, business risk right? Business goes bankrupt. You'll be able to be protected through CIPIC up to that 500,000, okay? Um, so that's how that works. And there's also, um, if, um, I'm sorry, if you would put the CIPIC website in the chat so y'all can have that, that would be wonderful. Um, and this will also be in the um, email when this presentation is sent out later as well. So you can learn more at, at CIPIC on their website and check them out. But that's something that is um, so FDIC is bank. It, I mean, it is in the securities world to answer your question, Allie. FDIC is bank, banking. So bank accounts, checking accounts, right? And I think that's only up to two, I think it's 250 per account, right? In a bank, but this is specifically for investments. It's not a bank account. Oh, sorry, Leah, I have another question about that. Does that mean um, you don't have to like apply for it? You automatically get this protection? Automatically get it, yeah. Okay. There's, you know, there's no application, there's no anything like that. Correct, this is just what is around for everybody who has an investment account, okay? All righty, so let's talk about asset allocation and what your life cycle is. I want you to think, I'm, I'm gonna describe a situation here. How many of you have seen or heard on social media or YouTube or something where somebody's like, invest in this and you're gonna make a lot of money or put your money here and you're gonna get X amount of returns or this is what everybody's doing right now, right? So there's, there's that. And the potential for that is if we go into investing with like doing what everybody else is doing because that's a hot thing to do, typically people can end up disappointed. So what if we just have a strategy, right? a strategy so that we can reach the returns that we're looking for and have a plan for that. Well, that's where asset allocation comes in. Okay, so it's what asset allocation is, is it's finding this balance between investment types that is challenging enough, right? So there can be large categories of asset classes. So investment types and asset classes is stock. And within that stock, there's all kinds of categories. So I'll break this down. Mm, think about, um, think about your, Electronics. Think about what you have in your living room, maybe a TV. I don't know, what's another electronic somebody has in their living room? I just have a TV. Uh, kitchen, what's in some electronics in the kitchen? Microwave, smart oven, what In else? Instapot. Instapot. Okay, we got all these electronics, right? And they're household electronics, right? They all get plugged in or something, right? They're of a similar asset but they all have different functions, different things that they can do, different perks, right? So that's like an asset class within the stock world. There's stocks and there's different types of stocks and they all have different functions, but they're all at stock, right? So 
there's larger categories of asset classes when you're able to have that when you have asset allocation, okay? So that's what that is. And it's really important to have that. There's one thing to have diversification, which we talked about last time, which is that plate of food, right? Where if you were to eat rice every day for the rest of your life, not exactly nutritious, but if you throw some salad in there, maybe a little bit of beans, if you're a meat eater, a little bit of meat, you know, you're getting all the colors in there. That's diversification, okay? But asset allocation is within that particular item, rice, I'll give that example. Maybe there's some wild rice, maybe there's some brown rice, I don't know, jasmine rice, see what I'm saying? So that's how asset allocation works. Okay, any questions, comments before I move on? Okay, so it's important to have that and I'm gonna share why. I'm gonna walk through this right now. Uh, so there's this investing life cycle, AKA time horizon. So a shorter life cycle, think in your mind, could be, all right, it's January, 2022, and I'm gonna invest for a vacation in June. So I'm gonna go to the stock market and make all kind of money. That's a shorter life cycle. A longer life cycle is gonna be, for example, it's 2022, and I'm gonna retire in 2050, right? So those are the investing life cycles. So when it comes to investing and asset allocation, you gotta have that asset allocation that's in alignment with your life cycle. I'm gonna break this down even more because I'm seeing some confused faces there. <laughs> All right, let's go over some scenarios. So these are the asset allocation scenarios. So let's look at the first one. I have a bold there, high risk tolerance. Any ideas why that says high risk tolerance? Uh, because most of the money's in 80% stock. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, most of, they have like most of their funds in stocks. Correct. That is a very large part of it. Anything else? The person's age, Missouri says, yes. So that person has the ability to take on more risk because of their age. Therefore, 24 years old, they have an asset allocation of 80% in stocks, 15% in bonds, and then 5% in cash in their portfolio. So someone, you when you, you know, for those of you, if you're here last week and, um, or if you already have an account, if you're considering opening an account, right? There's paperwork that's required to get completed. So the person, wherever you, whatever you, or if you're doing this on your own, you gotta make sure you have the right asset allocation where you are and select it yourself or a professional can help you with that. But they're gonna take all this into consideration, okay? So there's a middle-aged investor who's 43 years old, high age, moderate risk tolerance. They may have 60% stocks, 30% bonds, and 10% cash. Right, so you see the drop there in the amount of stocks between the young investor and the middle-aged investor. And what's the other difference there between the young investor and middle age? What do you see? More liquidity. More liquidity. Yep, more liquidity, 10% in cash. And there's also an increase in the bonds. So I'll share something with y'all. Or I'll ask, how many of you feel like or miss the boat with investing between the age of 20 and 30-ish? Or, okay, I'm raising my hand. Or you had an account and you used it, completed it, right? That happens. So for me, I'm 43 years old, but I'm actually, for myself, I'm, 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 I'm right now for a time period, I'm more at a high, high risk tolerance portfolio. And I'm doing that because I'm trying to make up for lost time, but I'm also doing that with the guidance of a financial professional. And I kind of have that background, right? I'm not going to stay there forever. It's for a time period, right? That's where I'm at. Cause we have, you can, we can choose to do this. If you have opened up your own accounts, or even if you um, do this for your own 401k or 403b, right? Um, so that's where I'm at right now, but I'm not going to stay that way as I, when I'm 62 years old as this one. I'm not gonna stay at 60% stocks or 80% stocks when I'm in my 60s. You know, 
you, so if you look at the mature investor, there's their stocks have significantly decreased 30% in stocks, 50% in bonds, and 20% in cash. So they've dropped the amount of stocks they have because stocks are more risky than bonds, right? Because you're in the stock market. And we covered it last time. We have maybe have large cap, mid cap, small cap, depending what type of stocks in there, right? And they're all going to be performing differently, but they're riskier. So they have less 30%, but they have more in bonds, 50% more in bonds. Bonds, if you remember, is like a loan in exchange for when that bond hits maturity, meaning however the duration of that bond, maybe it's a 20-year bond or 30-year bond. And in return for loaning that money to the government or corporation, there's um, you can receive income from it later on in retirement, right? And then 20% cash because you're able to have more liquidity. Um, Jay is saying, can you explain why stocks are higher risk? Yes, I think I did, but I can explain it again. Um, so stocks are more higher risk because you're invested in the stock market. And there's all those risks associated with, like I talked about earlier, business risk, volatility risk, up and down. Bonds are not as volatile as stocks right? Because they're not invested in the market, stock market. So that's why they're more risky. However, with higher risk is what? Potentially. Higher returns. Right. With higher risk, potentially higher returns. So that's why I always hear about, you know, start when you're really young, invest, right? Um, I have to see a hand there. Allie, you have a question, comment? Yeah. In these scenarios are, um, does cash mean actual like liquid cash in a checking account or is it referring to like a suggestion to put that much in a savings, like something that's liquid, but still earning money on it? Or is it literally just cash it's, in hand? It, it's cash inside the investment account. Okay. So a security so, account. Cash. So you have, okay. yeah, you'll have stocks, you have bonds and you can have on cash or margin. So having cash there is basically the ability to have cash in that account that can be used to purchase more stocks or bonds or to basically just to have it in that account. So that 20% cash there, you know, over time, that's just um, returns. It could be returns from the stocks that are moved into cash over time in that account. Why would you keep it in that account? Are, are you earning anything on that cash the way you would a savings account? Or is it just because you would keep it there because it's protected by the it's keep You the keep it there. I see. You would keep it there because it's part of the um, portfolio. So that is, a, is considered an asset class, cash. So at, there's, there's a, asset classes within a portfolio, stocks, bonds, and cash is considered an asset. That's how they're felt. Yeah, but unless you're planning to purchase something with that cash, why wouldn't you just you put it in your savings account and earn that tiny bit of savings on it? It's part of, it's part of hedging it? risk. It's part of hedging risk within the, in the account. So... Let's say, like for example, is it required by the securities account? No, you can decide if you want to do cash or on margin. So okay. cash can be there to purchase more securities. If you have on mar margin is like basically you're at, because um, when you open an account, right, a brokerage account, you can decide if you want it on cash, if you want cash or margin. And margin is like taking a loan from the fund and you got to pay it back, right? But cash is something that you keep there within the account and it can purchase more securities. But you want to have more cash in there because you're pull, you're getting that moving from stocks and bonds into more cash into your account, the older that you get, and there's lower risk and you have that liquidity there. You're not you're going to have more liquidity at 20% cash than if you're at 5% cash. Right. But are you saying that mature investor has 20% cash in there because they're going to be buying stocks or bonds with it, or they're just leaving it at 20% or it's always growing? until they it's take it all so out. It's their allocation, right? Of their assets, right? So they have 20% of the portfolio is just cash in there. So they have that liquidity. They don't want to have the 80% stocks because if the, if the market goes down, all their money's in the stock. But if they have some money and more in their cash, they're going to have that hedge from losing more money. Follow? No, but I think we should move on because it might make sense, more sense to me later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, any other questions or comments on this before I move on? Nope. Okay. So uh, another part of 
having a portfolio is rebalancing. So there's asset allocation and then there's rebalancing. Has anybody ever heard of rebalancing? Yeah, okay. So rebalancing is something that it's buying and selling, right? You can read off there, funds and the investment funds. And it's gonna bring your portfolio back to its planned asset allocation. And there's the way that it can be rebalanced is on time or by tolerance. So based on time, time is I'm gonna get my portfolio rebalanced every quarter, six months or annually. You can make that selection or if you're working a financial professional, have that conversation. Tolerance thresholds are gonna be the threshold and go back here. The tolerance threshold right here for this middle-aged investor is 60% stocks. That's their threshold. But it can deviate. The, and that's where portfolio rebalancing comes in because what someone decided on right here, like this middle-aged investor, this is what my, my plan is right here, 60% stocks, 30% bonds, 10% cash. And it can deviate from that based on the different performances of the funds within the account. So I'll go over an example right now. So we got Leilani, right? She's got a long-term investment portfolio for retirement with an asset allocation with 60% stocks, 30% bonds, and 10% cash. The 60% stocks consist of U.S. large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, international stocks, right? She has her bonds are divided between government and corporate bonds. But over time, the investments that make up her portfolio change in value and drift away from her chosen asset allocation. They can change in value for all kinds of different things. Maybe that, you know, some companies are doing really well. Maybe some of them are not doing so well. Maybe if there's a mutual fund and the fund manager is, you know, buying and selling based on the behavior of the other individuals who are participating in that mutual fund, right? So if you look at the bottom line there, how what happens is the 60% in stocks and 30% bonds that this investor has drift to 65% stocks. So there's a 5% increase in stocks and 25% bonds. So it deviates from 30% to 25%. So rebalancing the person who's managing the fund, the account is going to rebalance and do some buying and selling to bring it back to the plan, right? So she wants to have the 60% stocks, 30% bonds, 10% cash, because that's the plan for her to be able to get the returns that she's seeking. Any questions with this? Does it make sense of rebalancing? And has anyone ever, go ahead. I was going to ask, is that something, um, I guess, like at the beginning when you open your account, uh, I guess, like, is that something you'd have to actively sort of track or would the fund manager sort of take care of it? Like if you say like, oh, if you can look at it every, I don't know, three months or six months, um, like if you have that conversation with them at the beginning to do it, say based on like to do it periodically, would you then need to still like follow up and track it or do they kind of take care they of it? They should be reaching you? out, letting you know, okay. right? So Again, the rebalancing can be based on time or by thresholds. So the individual, if you're working with an investment advisor or financial professional or have a portfolio manager and, or even your, your, if you have a 401k or 403b at work, you can, you can get notified. I get notifications. I'm, our, my 401k is with Transamerica and I'll get an email, you know, that balancing, you know, letting me know that there's been some deviation. So I, I elected to get notified by that, but typically the financial professional, if you're working directly with one, they will let you know, and you can have that conversation in the beginning. You can ask, right? You know, are you, you know, how often are you rebalancing portfolios? You know, and how am I going to know that you're doing it? Right? Those are questions that you can ask. Remember, and this is something I just had a conversation with somebody earlier today. If you're going to hire a financial professional, you can interview and ask them these kind of, you can ask questions. You don't have to go with somebody just because they referred to you or because that's who you found in online or something and everybody's saying they're great. I mean, you can find out and ask questions. So the rebalancing is super important because if there's any deviations, like we wanna get back on track, right? Um, Jai saying, how often should we rebalance? It, it depends, Jai, Jay, it could be, again, you can decide if you wanna have it um, every six months, quarterly or annually. It just depends, but when you're looking over your paperwork, for example, like I'm thinking of myself, when I um, signed up for a 401k through my employer, I just basically, you know, checked off for balancing or some just offer it automatically. You know, a lot of people just are not aware of it, that this is what's happening, okay? 
financial advisor, brokerage representative, do you have a recommendation of which we should choose in our financial? Oh, we'll get to that in a minute. Great question, Elsie. Um, I'll get to that totally though. I'm not gonna have a recommendation, but I'll give you some information. Uh, and then you can go from there. Any questions at all in this portfolio balancing? Okay. Okay. Ta-da! See there, Elsie? Look at that. Next slide. Who do, who do work with, right? Who is going to fit your investment needs? Okay. So I'm going to go through each one of these. Is there anything on here that looks totally unfamiliar to you? And you're like, what the heck is that? Anyone? I'm so curious. The two chartered ones. I hadn't heard of those. Okay. The chartered financial analyst and the chartered financial consultant. Yeah. Most people don't even realize some people have these designations. Okay. So I'm going to start first with a financial coach. So a financial fitness coach, that's what Sage Financial Solutions is all about. We're here presenting to you. A financial coach has gone through certification, cannot give you financial investment. I'm sorry, investment advice. The same with a financial counselor, an AFC cannot give you investment advice. However, they can support you with your goals and with your strategies and with your action planning. A financial coach can support you, for example, if uh, you're feeling some kind of way about investing your money and you know it's part of the plan and you really want to do it, but there's something coming up that's really worrying you about it, you know, um, have some concerns and some or you feel like you're not going to have enough um, habits to just continue investing, that's where a financial coach can come in and support you on the investing side, right? With some behavior change or coming up with plans to be able to have the habit of investing and working with you and supporting you and cheering you on along the way and coming up with brainstorming with things that is a solution that's a fit for you on your journey of starting to invest. A financial counselor is gonna be more along the lines of somebody who can um, help you do the things that you wanna do. So for example, um, let's say you start a new job and they have a 401k that they're offering you or 403b retirement account. And you've typically been somebody that kind of goes like that and picks how you're gonna do your strategy for investing with that employer plan. The financial counselor can really support you and help you um, check off the list and how to go about in implementing and starting the investing with your 401k and how and working with you on that. So they help you do the actual thing of it where a financial coach could help you more like along the, what are some of the concerns you have? How can I work with you? And we work together so you can get to the point where you're going to open that account. Financial counsel is going to help you open up that account. Do you see the difference between the two? Any questions on that the difference between a coach and a counselor? Okay, I want to drink some water. I'm going to go into the financial advisor. Financial advisors are everywhere. Does anybody know a financial advisor? What's a financial advisor? Get up by a financial advisor. Financial advisors are everywhere. Okay, anyone can call himself a financial advisor, but what I'm talking about is a licensed financial advisor. And you can find a licensed financial advisor or work with one at your bank. I mean, there's credit union. I just went into my credit union over the weekend. And it's so funny, I was like, oh, I think I'm gonna open a brokerage account for my son who wants a electric vehicle, because it was his birthday. And they're like, oh, we can have a financial advisor give you a call. And I'm like, sure. I'm thinking, why? I have been a financial advisor, but okay, have them call me. But it's great to have that as well. And that person's gonna be licensed. So they'll have taken courses and they have to get licensed. and. You might hear some terms like a series seven or a series 66 or a series 63. These are the different types of licenses a financial advisor gets. And they're, they're also um, regulated by FINRA, which is an institution that tracks all of the um, professional background and any disclosures of financial professionals, like a financial advisor. You can find a financial advisor. Who's heard of like New York Life? Oh, Northwestern. I've been approached by one that worked with Northwestern. What is Northwestern? Anybody? What is Northwestern? What are they known for? I thought they were a bank, but I don't know. No. 
Right. University. Insurance. Uh, that insurance. Insurance. <laughs> <laughs> insurance. So Northwestern Mutual, New York Life. Those are the big Kumba in the insurance world. They're mutual insurance companies. I have a background in insurance too, so I know a little bit about this. So these insurance companies will have financial advisors working there. I worked at New York Life and I also worked at Mass Mutual, another one. You may see Mass Mutual sometimes uh, as a 401k plan if somebody's had worked somewhere and they see Mass Mutual on your accounts. MetLife was another one. MetLife used to do um, have financial advisors and stuff working with individuals and families, but now they're only in the employer space. So employer benefits. It's the only time you can see MetLife. But why I'm bringing this up is because someone can work at an insurance company like a Northwestern Mutual or a New York Life or a Mass Mutual, LinkedIn Financial. I mean, there's a slew of them. And they have insurance and they have financial advisors who are licensed that will meet with clients and can talk with you about um, what your goals are, what you're wanting to accomplish. Now, remember, a financial advisor is going to get compensated too, right? So they typically have products. They may have insurance products that they can support you with that, that they'll get compensated in the form of commissions from the premium. They may also uh, manage investment accounts. And again, they'll, how they earn an, you know, money off of that is a percentage of assets under management, basically the percentage of, of uh, how many accounts that they have or whatever you deposit into them to manage for the investment accounts. They'll get a percentage of that, about 1% build quarterly. Um, typically, or it has goes lower than more money that you invest. Um, they also, financial advisors also work with financial planners. So you see on there, they have a certified financial planner. I'll get to that in a minute. You may also see a financial advisor and have a comma, and then it'll say CFA after financial advisor. It could be financial advisor, comma, CFA, or it could be financial advisor, comma, CHFC for a chartered financial consultant. So if you have a, someone who's approached you at Northwestern Mutual or other places and they have that comma and CFA or CHFC, that means they've taken some extra steps to get some further designations on top of the license that they have. Um, Missouri says, are financial advisors always tied institutions or can they be independent and still be licensed? They're not always tied to institution. Well, mm, take that back. So um, when I brought up New York Life, so that is like called a captive company. It's captive because, for example, I'm a financial advisor and I work at New York Life. I'm primarily going to talk about New York Life products. I'm primarily going to talk to you about New York Life life insurance. I'm primarily going to, right now I can go out to the market and find other insurance for you, but I'm primarily going to want to do New York Life. And the reason for that is because that's a New York Life company. They have their own product, right? So they're still gonna to wanna to provide solutions for the clients, but they're mostly gonna to wanna to focus on New York Life. Now you can be at an independent firm and that's actually where I did start out in my career as a financial advisor. I was at what's called an independent firm. And what that means is like, I'm not held captive to just a specific insurance company, right? It's independent, there's a broker. I can have access to more insurance companies. Um, however, they are gonna be tied to what's called a broker dealer. So there's gonna be brokers They'll have a brokerage and that's where all the investments are held, okay? And that's where the compliance department is gonna be. So I know this is a lot. The financial industry is, it's pretty wild. A lot of people don't realize how complex it is, but someone could work at an independent firm like I did. And then whenever I had a client and I was in, had an investment account, it was managed by the broker dealer, which I think was called Securian Financial, big company in Minnesota. Right. And so that's where all our compliance and stuff went. So there you go. But as an independent uh, firm, you know, the difference between working at an independent firm versus when I was at New York Life was as a financial advisor, I was highly encouraged to hit my sales quota for New York Life products. Right. Um, and that's the way that works. Although there's other products as well. I'm not saying that they're not great vehicles because they are, but just, just an awareness of that. Okay. All right, so a chartered financial analyst is somebody who has taken the extra step, a lot of studying on investment strategy, high-level money management, wealth management. They've, they've done some, um, and also investment research. So that's what they focus on. 
When I say investment research, that means that they've got another layer of education on being able to research investments and funds, things like that, right? So they're gonna totally not my world. <laughs> I would not do well with it. <laughs> That's just me though, on becoming a CFA. It's like really, um, it, it takes a lot and a lot of, um, a lot of education. So you can have somebody who's a financial advisor, like I said, who also has a CFA. Or you can see somebody who's just a chartered financial analyst working at a firm. Uh, any questions on that or what I'm going over so far? Any comments? And okay, so the CFP, Certified Financial Planner. So that is a certification process where an individual studies on financial planning and then they go through a review with a board, the CFP board, and then they got to follow the requirements of the CFP board. So it's pretty rigorous. And in order to get a CFP designation, they got to get approved by the board of CFPs, right? And so someone could be a certified financial planner um, and may hold an AFC. That's out there too. Some financial planners go and they learn um, they may have an AFC or, you know, maybe a, I know a financial planner who has an FFC as a financial coach because a person who studies to become a financial planner doesn't necessarily learn the skill set of being a coach. They're two different things, but they can bring that into their world as a financial planner. And the chartered financial consultant, that CHFC, that's similar to a CFP. Someone could get this designation with an organization called the American College. The difference is there's no board review, no board requirements like a certified financial planner, but they cover, I'm telling you, the same materials. And then some, the chartered financial consultant will also um, look into financial planning and learn about um, diverse families and, um, and the LGBTQ plus community, and then also with small businesses. Um, so they have a little bit of, training more than a financial planner. They just don't have a board um, that they go to for review or to pass a board exam in order to get designation, but they got to go through extensive training through the American College. So again, you could see someone who is a financial advisor who works at um, Northwestern Mutual and has a CHFC designation. Or you could see a financial advisor who works at um, Mass Mutual and has a CFA designation. Now, mind you, even if you work with a financial advisor and you go somewhere at a captive place like a New York Life or you go to an independent firm, if the financial advisor is offering a financial plan, they will have a financial planner, financial planners that they work with, that they consult with, where the plan is coming from. If you meet with a financial advisor and they say they can give you a financial plan and you ask, oh, do you have a financial planner you work with in your, on the team or at your organization? They're like, no, run because <laughs> they're just coming up with something. But typically, like even when I was a financial advisor, I was able to do financial plans. I didn't create them. I worked with the financial planner at the firm and everything went to them. How do you know which one you need? Exactly, great question. It's really gonna come down to where you're at, like who fits your investment needs is a question there, right? So let's say for example, um, I gave the example earlier about somebody who, um, let's see, um, wants to start investing. I'll give this example. Maybe there's somebody who really wants to start investing, but they don't really know where their money's going. And they keep trying to come up with a plan to stop spending money and it's not working out so well. And they're just in this cycle. A financial coach would be somebody that would be great for that individual because if they go to meet with a financial advisor or with a financial planner, and they don't, understand, they don't have awareness of how much money they're spending or being able to change their behaviors, a financial planner may look at this individual and get like their budget, like they'll give them uh, worksheets to fill out, like, you know, what's your budget and things. And they're like, well, you're spending a lot and you're not gonna be able to reach your goals. So come back when you can't. That might be what a financial planner does, right? So that individual may well do well working with a financial coach or even a counselor first before going into the office with a financial advisor or a planner. So a financial advisor, you know, again, it's going to be something that depends on what someone's looking for. Do you want to get a financial plan from a certified financial professional directly? Go to a financial planner. And a financial plan, what that is, is like, let's say, um, 
Last week I talked about like an investment advisor, which by the way, that's not on there, but there's investment advisors. And, or no, let me give this example. I was talking to, um, I talking to, talking to a client earlier. Yes, this morning. Um, and she was saying that she wants to invest her money and start a business. And so we had this whole conversation and I was asking her if she has a financial advisor. She's working with a professional. She said, yes, I meet with somebody at Edward Jones. Great. And I asked her, what are they talking with you about? And they're only purely looking at her investment account with Edward Jones. So that individual is, is doing great work, right? But they're, it's like kind of looking through like a telescope and that one thing only, the investment account. There's all kinds of other things that come into play that can derail somebody's investment uh, goals. What would be some things that could derail somebody from their investment goals or retiring? Any ideas? No income, absolutely. That would derail. Yeah. What if somebody say lose a job? Lose a job. Okay, great. So if somebody loses a job and has no income, what is something that can be in place to help them get by? What's needed? Give you a clue. An option for liquidity. Right. There's going to need to be a savings to establish. So when you hear about that three to six months of savings account, right, having cash there, somebody has that cash there. If they lose their job, maybe get some unemployment that can help them stay afloat, right? So that's one bucket. Another thing that can derail somebody financially is not having um, access to high quality credit. So that means that they have a lot, maybe on collections or credit scores low. Um, they're not able to get a loan or they're not able to apply for something. They get denied, right? That's something that can derail somebody from their investment goals. Not having enough insurance is another one, right? Debt having too much debt, not enough income, not having uh, enough insurance in place, like homeowner's insurance. Those are the kinds of things that can derail people financially. A financial planner is gonna look at all of that. Financial planner is gonna look at someone's um, cash flow, how much, how much they have in their liquid assets. They're gonna wanna know how much debt they have, where's their credit at. They're gonna wanna know what insurance they have in place, right? And then they're going to want to know what type of investment account they have, whether they have something at work or they have their own IRA on their own. And they're going to look at everything and provide a plan based on what the individual's goals are. Let's say somebody says, um, I have a goal of retiring in the next 10 years, or, you know, I have a goal of buying a home in the next five years. And they talk to a financial planner about that. The financial planner is going to take all those things I just talked about and be able to create a plan and show that individual, yes, it's possible you can reach that or no. And yes, it's possible. And here are the things that can completely derail you. You need to beef up your disability insurance that you have. You need to start getting that at work. I don't know. They can give that kind of a recommendation. So that's what a financial planner does. Whereas someone who's just purely looking at investments is only looking at investment account. Any questions over what I just shared? Um, would you mind, uh, Leah, going over again the difference for, between the chartered financial analyst? I don't think I got that. I mean, I wrote down a little bit of what you said, but yeah. So a chartered financial analyst is somebody who's gone through a sense of studying, right, to be able to like investment research, high level of money management, wealth management. Um, they've really studied the investment sides of things, and they can really study funds. They can, they have that extra element, that training for that. A financial coach doesn't do that at all. Definitely not a financial counselor. Financial advisors don't do that either. They may reach out to a CFA on the team to, you know, find out like, hey, or portfolio management is what CFAs do as well. They can look at portfolios and also be able to determine like what the returns are there, the type of fund that's there, stock, and they have extensive knowledge in that and training for, for that. Whereas is the CFA Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, is a CFA more of an expert in the field than correct? Another? Okay. Correct. They're more of an expert on the investment side. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions?
Okay, so like I was saying, you could get somebody who's a certified financial planner. He may have a CFP and they may have CFA too. I don't know. You know, so just, these are just the different designations that you can see. Okay, anything else before I move on? Okay, so what about crypto? All right, people are always asking like, what about cryptocurrency? Should I invest in cryptocurrency? And I'm like, it's like the wild, wild west, right? Um, so the one thing about cryptocurrency, it's unregulated. So when I've been talking about all these stocks, they're regulated by the SEC, right? So if there's any loss, the SEC and other regulators can step in and help you recover from the loss, even if there's fraud, right? And also CIPIC comes into play, right? But it's, I'm sorry, CIPIC does not come into play with cryptocurrency. <laughs> They're not going to come in like I covered earlier. When I was talking about the Securities Investor Protection Corporation, right? They're not going to come into play with crypto. And it's a thriving atmosphere for sponsors because it's new, it's trendy, it's not regulated, um, and there's a lot of high pressure sales tactics. And um, it can have it can serve its function if you want to start investing in it, right? I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not somebody who's gonna say, no, you can't do it, don't do it. I'm just saying be aware of it, right? Of what crypto is, it's new. Definitely, I wouldn't say put all of those eggs in that cryptocurrency basket, um, you know, but that gambling thing like Ali, you were talking about earlier, where you've said that, you know, investing in stocks like this right here is definitely a gamble. You know, when you go to, when you go to a slot machines and stuff, and when you gamble, I mean, when, the, when, the, when it's gone, it's gone, right? When you go and gamble, you're not, you don't get your money back unless you keep trying again, <laughs> and then you can really lose. So, you know, it's really important to pay attention to this. I mean, I literally just heard, so I'm, anybody plays Settlers of Catan? Any, any Settlers of Catan fans? Anyone smiling? I play it. <laughs> There's game night on Thursday nights, a group of friends. Um, and we play Settlers of Catan. And I didn't go, I haven't gone in the past few weeks. And one of my friends, we were hanging out and he had let me know that one of the guys who we always play with got scammed through cryptocurrency and I went what you know and I'm thinking and I'm isn't you know I'm like I wish I was <laughs> that I know he was doing all this so apparently he was hit up through social media by this woman who seemed a professional and he went into it and went into this cryptocurrency and invested 50,000 and the person's gone so he's out 50,000 dollars not not a little and I could not believe this. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is the one thing that I talk about since woman, I mean, this is a guy, he's like an engineer and, you know, he got sold this and now he, he's not, there's no, he's not going to get a recover from it. It's gone because there's, it's not regulated. Um, there's no protection. So, you know, it's there, it's digital, it's new. It may be here to stay. They're saying it is I'm just saying, you know, be careful if you're going to look into it. Um, and I'm going to go into some of the um, things to look out for red flags and fraud too, right? So if it sounds too good to be true, what would be something where it sounds too good to be true to you? Anyone? Any thoughts of what would be too good to be true? Guaranteed returns, right? <laughs> no such thing. That's the second bullet point. There's no such thing at all. I guarantee if you put your money here, you're going to make X amount. Guarantee it. Oh my gosh. Well, let me tell you something. In the financial services world, working with financial advisors and at these firms, the word guaranteed, man, you can't. There's no way. Even if some, they, they, like, because they watch emails and stuff that go out in these firms, no one can put guaranteed on any of the correspondence to clients. Uh, so again, if you're working with someone who's a financial advisor and they send you something, they think it's guaranteed that run like run to the hills. Um, so just let you know about that. FOMO, fear of missing out, right? So if somebody's using this tactic of like, everyone's doing it, you got to jump on it now. Like, just totally look into it. Just be careful. That's a red flag. Or hurry up and send money, which is what I think happened to the guy that I play Sellers of Catan with. You know, hurry up and send your money. You're gonna miss out. You gotta do it. Like, hurry up. Uh, and someone is like super likable. I'm a likable person, but I'm not trying to sell you anything. You know. So, and this is one thing where I was talking about earlier. 
about the intuition and paying attention to like, um, just we have this natural instinct, that second guessing, right? Second guessing kind of comes along the way of like, after you've done something like, oh, or you're thinking, I don't know if I should really do that. But if it's like in the moment where you have that pause or you have that little, what does that feel like for you? For me, it's kind of like, um, I don't know. It's just, it's my intuitive hit. It's kind of like, sometimes I, I've, I've gotten better over the years and recognizing it. What, how does that show up for you? Anybody? Like, how would you have that intuitive hit where something is just not a good idea? How does that show up? Oh, uh, for me, it's like, oh, it sounds so good. And then you're like, wait, why is it? Like, this just doesn't feel right. Then you start, um, you know, when you think about it longer, because they try to get you to move. But then when you take time to think, you're like, okay, no, I don't want to move forward with this. Got it. Okay, so that's how it shows up for you. Thank you for sharing that, Tanya. Missouri says feeling rushed. Yeah, feeling rushed. Definitely. The pressure's there, right? Um, even if you're meeting, for example, with a financial advisor and they're rushing you to do something, mm -mm. You know, hurry up! Uh, I get this insurance policy, and they keep blowing up phones. You know, no, I've I've seen that happen at firms where I'm just like, oh my gosh, this person, you know, given as a bad name. Um, okay, and then be wary of gifts like free lunches or workshops that be offered, especially when it comes to like a cryptocurrency thing or something that's like an investment that's you know new. And they're like, come on, I'll get you some free lunch. Just show up. Uh, Annika says, maybe feeling like you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle, all of the info, right? Where it's just like something's kind of missing here. Like, I don't, I don't know. Very good point, Annika. Yeah. Something just doesn't feel right. Something's missing here. Just that feeling that we get. We're, we're you know, we have that. Um, and then sometimes things can happen where, you know, lesson learned. I don't think this guy that I know is going to be sending $50,000 online again. That's the other thing, sending money, that large amounts like that. Do the due diligence, find out, you know? So you can go to the SEC website. There's more information on there. You put the link in there, that'd be great. So you can see um, and find out more about information about that. So here's some resources available, right? So you can completely look into researching licensed investment professionals. Okay, so you can go to investor.gov or finra.org um, and you can literally look up individuals. Um, I'm actually, you know what, I might just take the time right now to show you like a FINRA one just because I'm here. So I'm gonna go to finra.org, okay? This is one of them. So this is what this looks like, FINRA, um, is a place where you can find out all about, uh, la, 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 where's it at? Like, sorry, this thing is like in the way, you know how Zoom is and it has a little screen and it messes everything up. You can't really see like you normally do. Let me see. All right. So you can do, right here it's called broker check. Okay. So I'm just going to put any name, James, what? Hello. Somebody comes up. I don't know where they are. This is Richard James. Oh, look at this. He's a registered broker and he's got a disclosure reported. I, I just honestly just typed him a name here. So this is an individual. You can go to broker um, check and you're finding somebody who is a financial professional. Sorry, James, I'm using this as an example. I don't know who this is. I literally just put in any name. <laughs> but you can go through here and see, remember I was talking about the series 63 and all that, series seven. So you're gonna see that this is a licensed individual. And then they got to list all the places where they've worked, right? So you can go ahead and do your due diligence here. I'm using finna.org. And you can also, um, and you can see right here, I'll say six years of experience is what he has in the industry and worked at four firms. These are disclosures that have to be provided. So just so you understand how it works, when somebody goes to work at a, you know, investment firm or a New York Life or something, there's all this paperwork and process involved. and it tracks where this person works. You can also look it up by firm. Okay, let me think. I'm gonna put up firm name. I'm gonna put up Mass Mutual. 
and I'm gonna put Walnut Creek because I know there's one in Walnut Creek. California. Does a disclosure uh, always refer to, I guess, like something bad or not necessarily? Oh, it does. Okay. I mean, it's disclosed for a reason. So as me as a financial professional, if I'm gonna go work somewhere at a firm, there's all this paperwork I gotta complete. And then it's, do you have any disclosures? Yes or no? No, yes. Sometimes it could be something, a disclosure could be something as simple as a client complaint or somebody complained on something. Maybe they didn't have a loss or it was just something, but that's not anything that's gonna be on um, this type of disclosure. You could see disclosures in the form of um, any judgments or liens. You can see that. Um, and, uh, or you can just, you know, find out, just look into it and it'll, it can be a little detailed too. Um, so here is mass mutual, right? Here's a brokerage firm. They do have disclosures. I don't know if they're going to have what it is, but their disclosures could be basically because it's an employee or something happened. I don't know. So you'll see here, you know, what they have Massachusetts mutual. This is a holding. They're going to have all the information that you need there. Okay, of all the uh, head honchos at that firm. Okay, so you again, you can if you're thinking of working or working or or working with a financial professional, um, you're not going to find a certified financial planner here unless they are working um, at a firm, right? And they have these other series sixty three licenses, but they usually that doesn't happen. If you have a CFP, you have a CFP. Right, you're not going to be a financial advisor. You're a financial planner. So, um, but yeah, is this helpful? So this is the one through Finra, and you can just do research by city if you wanted to. Let's do Oakland, California. See what pops up for financial professionals here. So you're going to see a bunch of different people here. Okay, um, Morgan Stanley, Berker Wells, farm even farmers, farmers insurance. Farmers Financial, okay, because they have financial professionals there as well. I hope that was helpful, but you can totally look into it. And if you see a disclosure on there that somebody has a judgment or a lien and they owe the IRS, <laughs> not a good idea. I mean, maybe this could be done to get it off the record. I don't know, but um, it's kind of a good idea to just really look into that. Any questions over what I just went over right now? Anybody? Comments? Did you know that there was something like this that existed? I'm curious about that. Yes, no, I'm seeing no from Elsa. Great resources. No, I did not. Okay. Not until today, suggested. So yeah, see? It's a good thing to look into. All right, so, oh, sorry. Um, yes, it is very good to know because, again, as it is, investing money can have its risks, right? And so you wanna invest your money with individuals who don't have disclosures, um, especially if there's, they owe money and judgments and liens and things like that. Um, because again, that's just a, talks a lot about their character, right? Um, so why, why invest money with that individual um, or trust that they will be able to, you know, come through for you. Okay. All right, so then there's SEC, Edgar. So this is a, through the SEC, it's a platform that can be used where you can do some research on research on investment products, where you can kind of just look into it a little deeper on a different type of uh, investments, different stocks. You just want to check it out. The FINRA Fund Al Analyzer is another one. That's through FINRA. Let me click on that one. Let's see. I think I'm going to what comes up. Um, you can put in the ticker, right? The ticker basically, just so you know, is a little three, four letter, three, four letter words. Um, so you know what the stock is and you can look at the cost and owning of the funds. I mean, this is just kind of information that you can do on your own um, and just kind of look into it and just see the performance or what different stocks that you want to invest in and check it out. But these are great resources to have. Now, financial professionals working at firms you know, they have access to somebody who's going to be like a CFA or a team of them um, and that are there that are doing the 
research and they can really look into this. And they're not using the fund analyzer. <laughs> they're gonna be using all kinds of other different things within their firm um, to get that information, okay? Um, which is super important. So the thing is too, is like, if you're, one of the one key thing I'd like for you to consider is if you can, if you're wanting to invest on your own, right? And you're taking in what you're seeing on the news, what CNN is, just keep in mind that information is kind of delayed, but those who are working within the industry have real-time information um, and have the ability to go a lot deeper as far as like checking out the performance of a fund or what's going on with the stock and whether or not it's a good investment or not, and whether to move you or not. Um, and they have the credentials to really look into this and to really analyze the different stocks and the funds to give you solid advice. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Annika's taking off. Anybody? No, that's all right. Okay. So would love to know how you're thinking you're going to start investing. So that's like, what's next? Are you going to do it on your own? Like I'm going to open, you were here last time we met, it was about, you know, how to open a brokerage account and working with a robo advisor or financial professional, are you gonna hire a professional or are you gonna do both? So would love to know or identify for yourself, which one is it? Anybody care to share what you're thinking? Is there gonna try it on? Uh -huh. Cool, cool. Same to Zelly, right on. Anybody else? Let's really get a bit older. Okay, why the question mark? I was just thinking that uh, as I have more specific retirement goals, then that was that would when I would want a financial advisor to really like drive a portfolio somewhere. Whereas right now I'm just trying to like not have money that's losing value over the course of inflation. Got it. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Very interesting. Um, I do have a poll, would love to have you put that up if you could, um, just to get a sense of where everybody's at. Um, Elsie says, I kind of want to do both. My next step is open a brokerage account in the next few weeks. Very cool, Elsie. All right, you can open up that brokerage account. Did you come to the first session? <laughs> you did okay all right so pick one what's next all right and just in case um you don't see the poll um there is um sort of a poll button on the bottom tools on the bottom toolbar on your screen. We have a couple more seconds for folks to complete it. All right, here we go. I'm gonna launch the results. All right. Here are results. 50%, I'm ready to invest on my own and meet with a financial professional. Woo that's awesome. Okay, we got a tie, 20%. And you helped figure out if I'm ready to invest or I'm ready to invest on my own. Another 10%, I'm going to schedule an appointment. Wonderful. Uh, Ali saying, FYI, for those that are doing their own investment accounts, our 401k manager recently showed me this website, which I love, fossilfreefunds.org. I haven't heard of that one. See, there's so much information out there. Now I want to go, now I want to go to it. Um, I'll check that out later. All right, so... Um, Wonderful. Let's see here. So, um, long screen there. So, for those who need help figuring out if you're ready to invest, um, I'm curious if you care to, if anyone wants to share. Like, what is the thing that is coming up as far as figuring out if you're ready to invest? Is it more of like financially, am I capable of doing it, or is it? emotional. I'm just curious. If you want to share, great. If you don't, you don't have to. Um, but those are the things to take into consideration, like figuring out if you're ready to invest, really taking a 
having an understanding of what your financial foundation looks like, right? And knowing if I'm ready to invest, we had a conversation last time. Um, okay, so Ali says, you can also find info about gender equity refunds and other social issues like prisons and weapons investment. Very cool. Right, I'm just really into this fossil free funds. It's like a report card. You can just type in the, the exchange code and find out about all funds and stocks and how they are investing, or mostly, I guess, funds, how they're investing across the fund. Love that. That's so important, I think. Um, because, you know, for me too, I, I love that kind of stuff too, because I'm all about the financial empowerment for communities of color. And if there are funds and things that I'm investing in that are not in alignment with that or doing the opposite, I don't want, I don't want anything to do with it. That's me personally. Okay. So we're here at the end of this today. Um, what is one thing I'm curious, feel free to take yourself off mute or put it in chat. What is one thing that you're going to do to start on your journey, whether it's figuring out if you're going to, if you're ready to invest, invest on your own or work with a professional mind? What is one thing that will move you towards that? Do you think that can be done in the next 30 days? 30 days. Putting money aside that I know I want to use to invest. There you go. So having that designated amount, stop spending and get a Roth IRA. Look at Tanya. Budgeting, says Jasmine. All right. Yes, all of that is getting ready to invest and having the plan and moving towards that. And I did talk about that the last time we were together about um, spending plans and having that awareness of, you know, if I'm ready to invest, you know, do I have that foundation together? Do I have that there? Am I ready yet? Um, not to put the cart before the horse, right? We gotta get that found, we gotta get that foundation of having enough in savings to get us through unexpected events, opportunities, right? And have the ability to continue to replenish that account. Um, so having more income than expenses, the whole saying spending below your means, you know, being creative since gas is more expensive. I mean, I had this conference. I don't know about you, but okay, I got to share this because I couldn't believe it. I like to get like the, the five dozen eggs. I eat a lot of egg whites for my meals. And it was like, oh, you know, $9.60 about a month ago. Same store, same thing, $14. And I'm going, oh my goodness. How did, I could not believe it. So my kid, I had this conversation in the car have a learning moment here <laughs> and I was like and we talked about it it's like why is it so expensive and I said it's inflation he's like why are they doing that they just need to stop <laughs> it's like yeah I wish but you know I just as, again it's just being creative right now things are costing more right um and just again when it comes to like the spending and where I'm you know I'm not willing to give up my eggs because I love eggs so I'll give up maybe something else a little bit, but we can all get through this for sure. Okay. And yes, there is a decline in the market. And that just means that things are also on sale. So it's on sale, right? So when something's on sale, I don't know about you, but I'm going to get more when it's on sale. All right. So any comments, feedback, takeaways from today before we wrap this up? In a long day. Leah, will you be having any more of these classes, courses coming up? I am not, but there's going to be one in April that Sandra is doing. Do you have a little more information on what that's going to be? Team Missouri, Nina, or Jay? Um, I'm not. This is my last one. Yeah, yeah, we have one tentatively planned for April or planned for April 20th. Um, and all of the recordings are on our Women's Foundation California YouTube page. I'm gonna put some information in the chat about sort of how to stay connected with our financial education series, but Lee, I don't wanna um, interrupt you if you have anything else you wanted to cover. No, nope. okay, well then I'll throw these links in the chat.
<laughs> um, all right, so yes. there's a few links in the chat, but um, they're all very helpful. So um, like I said, you can um, learn more about California Women Rising and our financial education series by clicking on that link at the bottom of that webpage. You can sign up for our emailing list and you'll be notified um, of the upcoming um, financial education series. We also have um, um, a healing circle focusing on storytelling coming up as well. Um, there's also a link to learn um, more about Leah and more about Sage Financial Solutions as well. And then I will ask you all to please complete the survey. Um, this will help inform future financial education workshops. We want these to be relevant and helpful to you. Um, so please just take a few minutes to complete the survey. Um, and by doing so, you could um, win an item from our Women's Foundation California merch store. So please take the time to do that. Thank you in advance. Um, Y'all will be receiving an email from me with um, the presentation slides. Um, a link to this recording and past recordings as well that are on our YouTube page. I'm sorry, I don't have it in the chat right now, but I can throw it in there. Um, but Leah, thank you so much. Um, if y'all can show some love to Leah in the chat, that would be great. Um, thank you for your guidance and expertise and just sharing, just sharing, sharing all of that with us, just being in community with us today. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. It's been a wonderful experience. Um, glad to have been here for all of you and would love to see you all again. You never know what the future holds. And you're so welcome for being empowered, Tanya. I love it. Okay, I'm glad there's a lot of information. I, I gave a lot that most people don't know about and really talk about to folks um, from the financial services side, but I think it's important stuff for you to know. So have an amazing rest of your evening. I am going to go, like I said, binge watch love is blind <laughs> and eat some dinner that's what i'm going to do to enjoy the rest of the evening everybody have a wonderful evening all right bye everyone happy international women's day bye.